Welcome back to The Simple Idea. Today I'm sitting down with Henry Carroll. I actually discovered him through a series of books. Uh, he happens to be a writer. And these books are very informative for people who are starting early on in photography. Uh, and since reading them, I've been very curious about Henry as a person and some of the stuff that he's been doing. So I decided to reach out to him. And I just so happened to be having a conversation with him today. So Henry, how are you doing today? I'm good. Hi, Nico. Thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. Um, like I said just a moment ago, your books, I discovered them within the past year. And at this point, I've happened to go gone through pretty much all of them. I think I haven't gone through two of them. Uh, the one related to Instagram, I think, is I one have. of the ones that I'm missing. But every single one of them, they've been extremely uh, informative, I want to say. And yeah, um, right. yeah, it just kind of inspired me to get off of my butt and try to practice some of the techniques that you've uh, discussed within. So before we get into it, uh, would you mind giving the listeners a very brief introduction or bio behind who you are, where you've come from, um, and something of that nature? Yeah, so uh, my name is Henry Carroll, and I'm an author. Um, I suppose one of my uh, better-known books is Read This If You Want to Take Great Photographs, um, and that's grown into a series I'm originally from London, and now I live in Los Angeles. Okay, awesome, awesome. So, I when speaking through you through email um, over the past few weeks, uh, I actually discovered that you're. I don't. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to say you're not a photographer, but you kind of let me know that you're more so gravitating towards writing these days. Um, can you kind of walk us through beginning to now in terms of your creative uh, ventures? So when did you start photography? When did you exit photography? And when did you decide that you were going to take up writing as a full-time uh, thing? Yeah, so I um, have always taken pictures, I think, from the age of, you know, I don't know, seven, six or seven years old. I was, you know, I developed an interest in photography and then my... I have a degree in photography and um, a master's in photography. And then uh, after I graduated, I practiced uh, as a fine artist and um, pursued my, my photographic work. And then okay. alongside that did, did teaching. And then um, I, was, I was always, you know, I've always been very interested in photography, but I think I sort of developed this um, – I think I, I sort of fell into writing as another means of uh, creative self-expression and a natural way to explore that writing, I suppose, was, was through my interest in photography. Um, so as I developed um, the interest in, in, in words, I sort of naturally drifted away from the act of taking photographs and um, that side of things and and ended up sort of writing more about photography and thinking about images in that way. Okay, that's definitely interesting. So I, I just want to ask you very quickly, uh, where did you study photography at, um, out of curiosity? So I study my, my, my BA was at the Surrey Institute of Art and Design, which has now changed its name to something else, uh, which okay. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, can't, I don't know what it's called now. This was quite oh. a long time ago. And then I did uh, my MFA at the Royal College of Art in London, which is still okay. called the Royal College of Art. Yeah. Nice. And nice, that, was, nice. that was a great two years of full-time immersion in um, photography. And that course really gave me a lot of freedom to pursue my own specific interests within image making, um, which a degree course – doesn't necessarily do a degree course. We're going to set you projects each semester. And you know, sometimes you that, that, that's great because it allows you to explore what sort of different areas you might be interested in. But at the same time, you end up doing a lot of work that maybe doesn't reflect who you are or what your interests are. Oh, I never thought about it like that. Um, I actually got a chance to study abroad in London over the summer and I took a photography course at the University of Westminster. Oh, yeah, um, that's a good course, yeah. Yeah, it was a really cool course. Um, shout out to my professor, Rakesh Mohindra. I'm not sure if you've heard of him or not. Um, uh, but, yeah, he, yeah, you he know helped. What? I think I do know Rakesh, 
You actually, that's kind of funny. I'm gonna tell. <laughs> I'm gonna tell him I had a conversation with you. I met him once through a travel company that I. Uh, oh wait, started. really? Yeah. Did, did he didn't put you uh, in touch with my books and stuff? Did he? No, what's funny is, see, I was, we were on um, like a class field trip, I think, and I was uh, telling him that I, I'm like really interested in reading and just I read all the time and whatnot. So he's like, oh, well, if you're interested in reading and you're taking a photography course, go check out a few books. So I think we were like walking around one of the libraries at one point in one of the museums that we went to, and I might have picked up one of your books. You know what it is? I picked up one of your books and I picked up, um, I think it's why why we should sleep by Matthew Walker. I might, that might be wrong, but I picked up two books. One of yours was in there. He's like, Oh yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic book. You should check it out. And I, he might've mentioned you and that might've been yeah. the reason why I picked Maybe up Maybe it's book, a different Rakesh I know, but I, I'm sure he, did he study at Westminster as well? We're getting way off topic now. You probably need to cut this out. Oh yeah. But listen, did, totally fine. <laughs> did, did he, did oh. he study at Westminster? Do you know? Because I know Rakesh, the Rakesh I know did actually study at Westminster, and then um, yeah, maybe he went back to teach on that course, which a lot of people I think do. there's a high p- possibility that he did um, yeah. study there. I, I still have his email, so I can reach out to him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to connect the, the puzzle pieces for you here. I'll get back to you. But yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I had a I had a course with him. Really awesome course. Had pretty good experience, and um, yeah, I don't know. It was just really good time and that's ever since then that's when i started to get more into photography personally um Mm -hmm. like i always knew like friends and family um you know to have cameras and to go out and take pictures i'm like oh that's something you can do but it was never something that i um it's like okay i like i'm very much aware that cameras exist but never really touched one up until last year which is kind of insane considering that i'm what 22 now so Mm -hmm. the first 20 years of my life just completely disregarded the camera as like a a tool for creative expression um and for you personally you said that you went from um using a camera and then more so going towards writing and this might be a very i I don't know if it would be fair to call it ignorant or not but in my eyes i've tried writing i've tried photography i feel like writing is something they're they're both very thoughtful art forms i want to say but i think writing is um something that comes across as more a little bit tougher to do like what is it that drew you to writing more so than- i think i think the thing is with with the, the difference between writing and photography you know one of i, I don't know, i wouldn't say it was like an issue i had with photography but i think i was um always feeling slightly like i was um Photog- because with photography, you're dealing with a, a little machine, a magic box that takes pictures, and um, mm-hmm. you know, often that's kind of traditionally how you rely on as your tool of trade. There's a real distance between you and your subject, or the creative process can be quite stop starty. And I think with photography, um, it's it's kind of quite hard sometimes to immerse yourself. In it, and it, this depends on very much kind of what area of photography you're operating in. Um, and I think there, okay. for me, there was always a slight f- frustration or lack of um, sort of creative satisfaction, I suppose, in in the in the in the process of, of taking photos and um, and it, and the sort of very kind of conscious technical aspects of photography were. Kind of a little bit uninteresting for me or again something that kind of got in the way of that pure feeling of like creativity whereas with writing all you need is um you know your fingertips and a computer or, or a pen and it's much less reliant on on a uh, kit or, or tools and it's okay, much more exactly for me saying. it's a much more immersive creative um pursuit i would say but i i don't think that's obviously um true for everyone but from my point of view my story that's definitely where i i kind of drifted 
into writing rather rather than sticking with photos. And I think it also it brings up another interesting thing that I feel like with a lot of um, with a lot of people, particularly when they're they're younger and trying to discover what creative area they want to to operate within. Mm-hmm. They sort of almost say, okay, well, and, and maybe this is true for, for me as well, I don't know, but it's like, okay, uh, I'm going to pick photography as my um, creative medium. Um, and then you get involved with that and you pursue that. Um, and sometimes I suppose that choice maybe wasn't the best one for you. Maybe you don't um, connect with that medium um in a way that you thought you would um what what i quite what what i really love about my shift into writing is the fact that i i always sort of feel like i never chose writing i really feel like it chose me i think my shift was very natural and therefore it feels okay. very right that i found my creative outlet um which which wasn't forced or or a conscious choice it was it was something that after much experimentation i just sort of moved into which reassures me that maybe i found the right area i don't know okay i totally understand what you're saying um and the way you kind of describe photography is interesting too do you feel like that's the same with um maybe would you say that's the same with videography or is videography um not so much reliant in terms of expression on on the tool because i think for and i could be wrong because I'm, I'm no video expert either but with video um for example uh, i think I, it's I a think... lot easier to tell a story through video so even if you can't even with like some technical aspects i feel like you don't have to be as like cognitive or like, as conscious excuse me um, I, I I don't know. I mean, like that—that's an interesting point about um, you know, it's easy to tell stories with video because with photographs, with photography, really, it's not a storytelling medium. We, we, you know, with this yeah. kind of like phase of Instagram that we're in, you know, everyone's saying they're a visual storyteller. Um, you know, that that, yeah. that expression is really strange because images are almost the most um, restrictive way of telling a story they can imply narrative they can imply a story they can imply meaning but really they can't tell you anything they can't tell you a story because you're just the very Mm -hmm. nature in that they they traditionally take a moment in time and they operate as singular entities whereas videography filmmakers um you know that, that they're essentially sequencing images and that is a way of creating a narrative and telling a story um so uh but then stories need to be mapped out and planned and structured and um all of those things so i i i I don't necessarily think that videography or filmmaking is any more immersive as a medium than photography i think they're the same but different in that way um and like i said like uh, i think there are people that are incredibly find find um the act of taking photos, editing photos, printing photos, mm-hmm. incredibly in, immersive in that way. Um, and um, they're very, very much operating on a subconscious level when, when they're in, in that process. But um, I think for me, it was slightly different. I was, I was operating, my, my interest was more so in terms of landscape. And in the end, I sort of was, creating models in the studio. So the process was very slow and mm-hmm. um, con- it was full of conscious thought, thoughts and decision-making um, rather than, say, a street photographer might be working on the street and working a lot more intuitively, not thinking consciously, responding to, uh, to, to encounters and moments purely on instinct. Um, so photography, like, we, you know, we, we, we just keep saying the word photography photography but it's such a broad term it means so many different things to different people uh there's so many different processes within the area of photography um that uh you can you can really make it your your own and uh adapt it to your personality or or 
the kind of way that you want to work. You know, I'm not sure what um, area of photography you're particularly interested in, um, whether it's yeah. kind of more like street photography or portraiture or landscape or fashion. But each one of those comes with its own um, unique um, set of re- requirements in a way of, of how you then create images. Okay, so that's definitely food for thought, and it's not something I've, I've thought about prior. And for any photographers listening to it, it's definitely something to, to kind of sit and ponder on. Um, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move into the next question that I have for you. And this is actually something that I pulled um, from a previous interview that you had. I forget with what uh, yeah. media company. Um, but do you think it's, it's necessary for photographers to seek mentorship or – is it something that you can kind of just go out and do and learn and, and build your own experiences? Uh, cause in that interview you actually mentioned, um, training your eyes to, you know, to hone in on photographic techniques. Um, I'm assuming somebody can't train your eyes for you. They can give you direction. I just want to get your, your thoughts on that. If I can, if I piece that together in like a linear sequence for you. So, so I think, um, I think the, the, in the last 20 years that the, the world of photography has changed a lot. And I think in general, the world has changed a lot and the way that we engage with images has changed and um, the accessibility of um, information is different. So I think Mm -hmm. in the past, it was quite difficult perhaps to say, train yourself um, or to fight to, to surround yourself in um, work that really was relevant and interesting to you that then you could not necessarily imitate but be inspired by and constantly question look, looking at it and questioning okay why is this good why am I responding to it um, whereas today you know we have a lot more access to to um, information um, through these kind of blockbuster exhibitions at museums and um, Mm -hmm. publications, just websites, internet, um, social media, all of those things. So in a way you, you can more easily sort of not necessarily teach yourself, but surround yourself in work that um, is, is inspiring to you. Um, Yet at the same time, and it, some people, some people, they they just have this creative voice. They're, they're sort of belligerent in a way, in that this is this is what matters to me, and this is the way I want to express it. Um, mm-hmm. And in many ways, that's great because that means that can result in very kind of honest, authentic, natural work that just kind of develops whereas a lot of us we don't have that gift in a way we're not you know we 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 need to explore different things and kind of figure out what our creative voice is and who we are how we want to express ourselves what the best medium is to do that Um, Mm -hmm. what are we interested in and how do we see things how do we then um you know what is unique about how we see those those for most of us are the things that then we do need help with in terms of like mentorship or a course or tuition. Um, so I do, I do think that still, yeah, I, I kind of do think most of us probably do need some form of guidance. Um, and I think that that's, that even when you get quite um, mature in your practice, I think that you, you still need guidance. I don't think you get to a point where you can just operate in isolation and be like, okay, well, I know who I am and I know what my work is now and I'm just going to go off on my own and, and produce it. I think we all need kind of other sets of eyes and, and discussion on what we're doing. Um, so yeah, that's fair. In, in terms of tra- the idea of training your eyes, that, that, that mainly comes from creating work and – you know, taking pictures and then really honestly kind of analyzing them and figuring out, you know, if they're successful or not for you. And I think a big trap that creative people fall into 
is that they produce something and they don't really then stop and question its quality or worth in, in some way. So they, they sort of, they don't develop in that way because they don't have that, that sense of self criticism and analysis, which is a huge part of the creative process. Um, we've always got to be slightly dissatisfied with the work we're producing. Otherwise, we don't really move forward um, with it. Of course, of course. So I think that's important to note. Um, I think, like like you said before, with the technology that we have now, it's it's really easy and, and simple to, to go on a, a, a website like... Um, what is it like Squarespace or Squarespace is for websites, but uh, like Udemy or, you know, edX or any of these other, um, you know, websites that have courses that teach on different techniques and things of that nature. But I, I don't know me personally, this is something that I'm still getting into and I'm sure whoever else is listening to this, uh, they might be entering a new field. Uh, the internet, it just makes things so easily accessible for everybody. Uh, it's it to make you wonder. It, 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 at the same time, it sort of separates you. I think it's kind of wonderful in one sense, and the, uh, on the other side, it's a sort of uh, it's a very kind of um, dangerous mm-hmm. way of engagement. Um, yeah. And I think people can rely too much on internet inspiration, and um, and also, I mean, going into the idea of like, well, one needs feedback on their work and. You know, people, Absolutely. A, a lot of they, you know, a lot of people they might take pictures and then post them online and and, and sort of um, ask for feedback in that way. But you know, who who is who who are you asking? Who who are commenting? On, 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 who's commenting on your work? What do you like, are you aligned in any shape or form with their idea of photography or creativity? So it can sort of guide you down the wrong road as well. And I think that. Um, in many ways, either kind of formal courses in artistic institutions are a mm-hmm. great way to sit around a table with people and share ideas and discuss ideas face to face and give you a very good idea of who and why you respect more in terms of their feedback. Um, whereas if it's too anonymous or remote, that process, then you can't really build those relationships with people and the feedback that you might be getting could be not the, not the best. So, so I think whether it's a course or it's, it, or if it's um, just like a group that you create, I think mm-hmm. you really need to kind of make sure you're, you're seeking advice uh, from, from the right kind of people. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, I do agree with that because the internet, like I said, it is useful, but it can kind of, you know, create a, like a barrier of separation between, you know, like you said, if you go on a site like Reddit and like, Hey, can you review this photo for me? It's not the same experience as opposed to you being in person with a group of friends or a group of like-minded individuals who do the same thing as you. And they're able to give you, you know, in-person feedback. I think there's a lot of value in that personally. Exactly. Uh, even, and the, it's, okay. we're going back to the idea of photography being such a broad term that encompasses so much, mm-hmm. you know, like a, it does. a street photographer is going to have a very different point of view of your landscape work. And a landscape photographer is going to engage with your um, street photography. I'm saying street photography. Uh, mm-hmm. um, in a very specific way and often there those those are so kind of like polarized areas of photography that perhaps you know those those kind of uh, those thoughts and feedback from those people are maybe not even if they're very respected in their areas it's maybe not that relevant to you so you could take what they say with a pinch of salt um, so, again, it's very important to, to find people that are operating in the same little pocket as you are in mm-hmm. photography, especially. Um, it's very subjective, I suppose. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I think being able to do that just, you know, 
it offers more perspective. And at the end of the day, that's only going to help build your work up as opposed to, you know, operating in the dark and assuming you're doing great or failing. So no, I totally understand what you're saying there. And I agree with it. Um, I don't ever want to shy away from the idea of, you know, having mentorship or even just a group of people that you can connect with. Um, and that's yeah, something I think that that's I, very, very important in any creative pursuit. Yeah. Uh, definitely glad to get your thoughts on that. And uh, going to this, and this is something that I still kind of struggle with a little bit. I understand it a lot more after reading and, you know, going out and, and shooting. Uh, but how do you, how do you measure, measure, uh, excuse me, success in photography? Cause when like anybody can take a good photo, but at the end of the day, like what makes a good photo, what makes a good photographer? Um, how is that determined? Is that like too broad of a question to ask? Because there's certain photos that I'll see. And I understand some of like the, the techniques that kind of go into it or um, like, I'll understand like the rule of thirds or like leading lines or, you know, it suggests something, but then there's some photos where I don't see any of that. And these photos are, you know, they're just, people love those photos for whatever reason. Um, would you be able to get yeah. like a very, you see where I'm I, going with this? Yeah. It's just, I mean, success as in a kind of, um, I don't know, is it a successful image or I, I, I think, um, I think again, with photography, we talk a lot about singular images and photography, um, uh, doesn't operate very well when we're asked just to kind of analyze, respond to a single image because it, a single image can't really give us that much. It's, it's operating too much in isolation. So, so I think it, to use an example of uh, um, someone very interesting in this way is, is Robert Frank and his series, The Americans, which is one of the most um, iconic photo books from the early 60s. And, um, you know, if you, if you look at a lot of, if you were to look at that work, um, just and, and sort of stare at individual pictures and try and figure out why it's good, you would always come up short because they don't really conform, particularly back then, to an idea of like uh, what, what, a, what a good photograph is. Um, yet, as a whole, as a series of a, as, a, as a kind of like edited body of work that has a, a beginning and a middle and an end, it takes you through this narrative and, and, and the project is very much his, his view of um, America at that time and him as an outsider really to American culture. So he, he could sort of see it in a, in a slightly more um, truthful or um, yeah, a sort of truthful or revealing way than say someone who is American and comes from that culture. Um, and what, what, what the project has ended, ended up as is, is this kind of really beautiful narrative piece of, of just that just takes you through the different elements of um, society in that way. And the pictures, um, you know, are definitely meant to be viewed in a specific order um, <coughs> and regarded um, uh, as a whole rather than individual. So I think if we talk about success in photography, yeah, we can all take a nice picture of a of a pretty view, but really it's a it's a you know it's a it ticks the boxes of what we think a good photo should be, but really it's it's a fairly meaningless image, or what it's just quite generic. Um, However, if we if we operate more in terms of like thinking about working in a series and how images work together, we can unlock a whole different dimension of photography that allows us to say things that are more specific and nuanced. And I think if we if we are to if I if I was going to say um, what a mark of a successful image is, and I'm mm-hmm. sure many people might disagree with this. I think it has to feel like it's come from a human being in a way, an individual. And I think a lot of images that we see that 
on Instagram or say something like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, yes, it's very pretty and beautiful and, and whatever, well executed. It's almost like, well, there's no real, there's no real voice in there that's unique to the person that created that image. It's a very generic image. And therefore, it's sort of uninteresting in a way because, because there's, there's no point of view in it in a way. It's you uh, see what I'm saying. So, yeah, think, that's exactly what you're saying. So, as artists, as creatives, what we want to aspire to do is, 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 is almost like produce work that could only have come from us, that has, um, in a heavy or light way, uh, our own unique individual stamp on it. Um, and I think that that's a big part of the creative process is feeding off your personal history to, 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 to make work that only you could have made. And I think that if you can achieve that, and that's the, very, that's the hardest thing in, in many ways, um, then you, you have found success with your work. Wow. Okay. So I've never had anybody explain that to me in a way that it makes sense like that. So thank you. Um, I definitely have a better idea and I know that's not like the universal answer to what makes a good photograph, but it definitely adds uh, another idea for me to, you know, to kind of work with. Uh, yeah. I, th- I, I think like- what we, if we, if we're specific with photography, what, what photography falls victim to is its own success in a way. Um, that we, you know, the general public respond very well to nice, pretty pictures that they can, that, that are inoffensive in a way. And, mm-hmm. um, but really the greatest and richest and most interesting photography completely goes against that um, visual language. And, um, but the sort of larger audiences and the general public Instagram hordes don't um, respond well. They're not. They're not. They don't respond well because that's not what they. Um, that's not what they've been taught to look for and appreciate in an image. For them, images should be easy and nice. Um, yeah. And there is exactly. a, there is an arena for those images to operate very well. Um, but really, that's not photography. Those images aren't doing anything to push photography forward or create a discussion. Or, or allow the people creating those images to really fully explore, um, you know, their own creativity and self-expression. Wow, that was wonderfully explained. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a lot to think about, actually, because like I said before, I've never had anybody explain it to me that thoroughly. <laughs> um, so my head's like kind of spinning right now. That's a wonderful explanation. Um So for this next question, I think you're going to have a pretty interesting answer for this too. Um, I would consider you to be somebody that's in a position of authority uh, based off of the books that you've read. I'm sure thousands, uh, if not millions of people have probably read them. Um, Do you think it's, it's difficult to learn more about photography outside of the, because you, you have the technical stuff down. um, And once you have the technical jargon down, um, it's just a matter of repetition and, you know, still executing on those principles. Uh, is there is there more that photography is able to teach you outside of that? Uh, I guess more so going into the the realm of life. If that makes sense. Yeah, the I mean, the, talk, you touch on the technical aspects there, and really, the technical aspects of photography are, are the the least interesting part of photography, and um, they are the in a way the easiest parts to master um i think it's about how then you you um you know photography and music is very similar in a way like one can um learn how to play the piano or or learn how to play scales and do it very well but then it gets to a point where you have to where that all of that kind of knowledge that technical knowledge Mm -hmm has to then somehow become a part of you in a, in a kind of sub unconscious intuitive way that then you can draw on it to, to really kind of freestyle and improvise and mold it into what you want to, to um, say with your work. 
Um, so if if people dwell too much on the technical sides, they never really get past that to a point where they can create um, where they can create really much more richer and interesting work. And I think to answer your question about um, learning more, what, what does photography, what can photography keep teaching us things? Well, yeah, I think it can because photo- photography is, is, a, is an amazing tool to, to, to analyze the world around us. Um, mm-hmm. Technology is always shifting as well, advancing, and that's shaping what kind of images are made and how they're made, and it's stretching the possibilities of perception. Um, but in terms of photography, is now almost found its its um, its reason for being because it's become the most dominant means of communication we create and consume images every single day now more than ever we're all photographers we're all um, critics of photographs in, in, our, in our own ways so it's really become a part of our everyday lives like it never has before and as a, as a result of that it's the perfect tool to really kind of help us to understand the issues that are facing us today um to 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 both help us understand what other how other people are perceiving the world, but also to help us understand how we perceive the world or want to perceive the world. <coughs> really, photography relies on us pointing our cameras at something that means something to us, and we will all point our cameras at something slightly different. And if we really stop and think about, well, why is that picture of that in that way? then we can really start to understand how people perceive what's going on around them. And I think that is where photography right now is such an important medium um, and that we can constantly learn from it. And I think it's just a question of like, how much time are we willing to give it? How many, how much time are we willing to think about images? There's a danger that photography is becoming very disposable right now. Um, but really we want to kind of dwell more on it to to kind of really allow it to tell us much more about the world. So yes, you can constantly learn from photography. Well, wow. yeah, that's I think that's also very well put. I think that's just at the end of the day, it's still allowing us to to always uh, how would I word this? We're always seeking to kind of understand each other, and photography acts as as a tool to help do that. And it's very, I mean, when I say that, it sounds very simple and the question almost seems irrelevant. Um, but the breakdown of it was very, very solid, actually. Wow. I, I, the I, thing is with photography, where it's unique is that photography requires you to respond to the world and take something from the world, take something that already exists. Whereas with painting, for example, we, we can create something from nothing. Um, it's a very different kind of uh, process, whereas with photography, we're reliant on what actually is there physically. And therefore, um, it, it's very dependent on what is happening right now. Uh, so, yeah, the, there's, it's a very, very s- specific medium to the time where we're in okay and then you you mentioned this twice so far already but with um i guess we can talk about instagram because that's you know a platform where pictures are pretty disposable um i guess that's a part of that like larger idea of what photography is doing in a way we're still trying to figure out how to to use that and my brain is like all over the place right now because you made a, like a ton of excellent points actually, but like with Instagram, for example, we're constantly being sold to where we want things to look pretty. We want things to be, you know, nice and organized and maybe not have much, you know, value in terms of, you know, forcing thought. 
but I still think in a way that's a part of the, the larger scope of what photography is. We're still trying to figure out what it's meant to do for us. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah. I, I, in many ways, photography relies on being invisible as a medium. Uh, it, it, if you kind of like use the analogy of a window, um, okay. what you want to – photography in the kind of Instagram realm um, – operates very well when you're, look, you, you're looking through the window at something. If you suddenly stop and become aware of the window itself, mm -hmm. then the whole system breaks down and you challenge what you're being told through images. And in terms of being sold to and um, the, mess, the, the messages, the controlled messages that we've we're receiving through the media, through social media influencers, all of those, all of those kind of uh, those people that do shape how we think about things. Their images, in a way, have to be very kind of neutral or generic or invisible because they don't want us to stop and think about what we're looking at. They just want us to accept it. Um, and photography is an extremely, extremely good medium to just for people just to kind of accept what they're seeing and the message that they're getting from it. Because basically we look through it into something that looks real. Well, it doesn't look real, but, you know, yeah. like I said earlier, it's like very much based on reality. Therefore, we invest so much um, trust in images. We don't actually question the context of their creation or the context of where we're um, mm. viewing them. And therefore, yeah, like, like I said, they make sure that we keep looking through the window and not at the window itself. Does that make sense? No, it absolutely does. And at the same time, going back to what you said earlier, there's, there's still like, um, there's, there's like a bit of an uh, oversaturation in images now more than ever. I mean, like with the iPhone 11, for example, that's that's a camera that can, or camera system, excuse me, that is on the back of a smartphone. And everybody has these smartphones that, you know, we can all take photos, we can all post these things to Instagram. And to the point where we see a photo and it's kind of just swipe, swipe, swipe. Mm -hmm. And wow, yeah, that that's just, it's definitely something to think about. Um, it's interesting about that whole kind of like oversaturation of images and things because even a hundred years ago, photographers were saying the same thing. They were they had the same worry about there's too many people taking pictures, there's too many images around. And it's you know, obviously like <laughs> that was a very different time to what, what we're swimming yeah. in now in terms of images. And I think it's always relative that in terms of like, I think we've always felt like we've been um, for the last 150 years kind of always felt that we've becoming more and more saturated with images and that it's harder and harder to kind of figure out what we should be looking at. And I just think the way that the world works is that we just gradually immerse ourselves more and more. The numbers get bigger and bigger and yeah. we're sort of maybe still feeling the same as we always have, but we're just going with this tide of, um, extremes and everything is, is more, 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 more. And photography certainly in that way. Uh, we're taking more pictures than ever. Um, yeah. It's great that that's happening, but at the same time, it's like, well, why are yeah. we taking pictures? What are we doing with those pictures? What are those pictures saying? Um, what is the point of it all? Um, I think those are the big questions to, to look at in terms of social media. Uh, who, who are the image takers and what is their agenda? Absolutely. Okay, so that's something I definitely need to, to think on a little bit more. And I think it's funny that you say that, um, you know, like 100 years ago, they were saying the same thing about an oversaturation of images. Like maybe 100 years from now, our problem or not, maybe this isn't even a problem, but what we're experiencing now um, will be, you know, child's play compared to what people a hundred years from now have to deal with. 
um, assuming yeah, we make it on it's, it's very photography is always kind of tied to technology and 100 years ago today just over 100 years ago the Kodak Brownie was released yeah. which was the first camera that you know the general public could operate um, in very um, and it was affordable and um, you know that opened up a whole kind of genre of family snapshot photography and things and the number of pictures being taken and that we were looking at you know exploded and in a way now with the smartphone thing it's the sort of equivalent a hundred years later of the kodak brownie you know it's just now it's just even easier even cheaper even faster so in a hundred mm-hmm. years or probably even less there's going to be another thing that's even, yeah even, we can't even imagine now but i'm scared cheap, faster <laughs> you know it's 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 again like we're just heading down it's world of extremes yeah no we definitely are and it's just going to be packaged differently so i guess it's only a matter of time but um so that pretty much yeah, wraps or, up all or, the or, questions or that i have same, for you okay i was just going to say or at the same time oh no go ahead go ahead i think that there, there is there is also something there's something bubbling away at the moment which is it's a kind of like resistance or a backlash to to the culture of photography now and, and the, the, the proliferation and the pro- proliferation of images and um, and the kind of sort of numbingness of them. And I, I think it's sort of in a way I, I sounded quite pessimistic in terms of like we're just heading down this road and we'll continue going. I, I do think oh, yeah. that, that there's something, I think that there's a high, big chance that in a way the we're going to, the acceleration will stop and we're going to want something different and we're going to wise up to, to, a, to the situation that we're in at the moment. It's no coincidence now that you know, there's a lot more people turning to analog photography and going back to film and they're really appreciating the slower, more thoughtful process that comes with that. Um, and I think that's definitely off the back of, of this um oversaturation of images and the speed at which we can create and consume images as well. So, you know, in terms of like technology, Mm -hmm. we are actually still very much taking pictures with film and analog technology. Um, Digital. Well, um, I, uh, Phil, I, I've only ever shot digital at this point in time, but film is something I definitely want to get into. Um, got to try to ease my way into it. But I also just had this thought, and I mean, not for the first time, but something I want to point out now. Um, I mean, the images that we do see on social media and all over the web and whatnot. I mean, at the same time, we nobody wants to see extremely powerful images at all times of the day. Um, you know what I mean? So that's why... I think when we see these images and they don't really do much for us, like they might be pretty, but they don't really offer it any real insight into anything necessarily. Um, it's just easier to absorb, but mm. at the same time, you can't forcefully shove images in front of people that might make them think about something, uh, especially if they don't want to think, but then we're left with, you know, we're left in a world where, pictures are all just pretty and perfect and nothing's wrong with the world. So I can, I can kind of see both sides to that. I think it just comes down to us being more conscious of like what we're absorbing information wise. And then that's just a bigger conversation outside of just photography. Mm. But yeah. And I, yeah. I, I think I, you know, there's nothing wrong with um, just sort of appreciating nice things in, in, in any way form of life oh definitely not as long as it doesn't um as long as it doesn't affect what uh affect the kind of standards of or 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 the kind of limits to which artists especially should be challenging us um in terms of shaping our ideas and, and commenting on the world um so even we don't want to become intolerant of anything that's asking too much of our kind of mind because we're so used to just receiving mindless images. Um, But at the same time, 
I think we, I, I think the huge, you know, the majority of the population really do not want to engage with anything beyond what's nice, and um, that's just a fact of life. And I, and I think yeah. in, in many ways, like with my books and what I try and do, it is actually engage with that specific person who, who, who. Who does have preconceptions about what photography is and what how what, how they should represent the world around them, and then through a very accessible, gentle way, kind of reshape those preconceptions and introduce them into it, it, introduce them to something that's more challenging that will allow them to tolerate that shift in perspective and hopefully then implement it or absorb it into their own. Um, image making. Um, so, yeah, we, yeah that, that's sort of my aim with my books in a, in a way. It's, 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 the tr- it's a hard, it's a hard territory to operate in because you're, you're really trying to preach to the unconverted in a way. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. Uh, it sounds like it's, it's steering in the direction of like a growth mindset, which mm. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a fan of too, but I don't know when you frame it like that, it makes it seem like people don't want to grow, but I know, I know exactly what you're saying. That makes sense. Um, I, th- I think people want to grow. It's whether they can grow or they, what, what they're doing to do so. Yeah. And, and also it's like, well, um, what, what, what paths, what, what routes are you taking to, open your mind and grow and things like that. And there's, you know, so many wrong paths one can take um, in all kinds of aspects of their life. And um, I suppose a big motivation for releasing my first book was that I really felt that I wanted to, to catch people when they were at the very early stages of their interest in photography and set them on a path that, um, in a way, I wish I was put on at a very early age. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, you shape shape their shape their understanding of what a going back to that idea of a good image is, an interesting image, a worthy mm-hmm. image is. You know, right from the start, rather than kind of hope that they'll discover it down the line. Um, which most people don't because by then what's ingrained in their uh, idea of photography is hot air balloons and sunsets. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I get that. And I actually want to um, talk to you about one of your books towards the end of our conversation. So I'm just making a mental note of that now. Um, So I think this is a good place to wrap up uh, the main portion of our conversation i do want to ask you a few quick questions and they're supposed to be a little lighthearted and you know throwaway questions very easy um nothing too crazy uh so keep it light and easy i guess i'm interested to learn more about um just you in terms of like what you kind of like dabble in photography was so are there any specific photographers that you uh didn't necessarily see yourself being interested in, but uh, you're kind of drawn into. It can be over the course of the past year, ten years, whatever it is. I'm just curious to see like what photographers you're following and and why they're interesting to you. Well, I'm I'm in the process now because I'm working on three new books this year, and um, I'm in the process of discovering a lot of new contemporary work that um, is super exciting and really it's fascinating to explore the themes and issues that contemporary photographers are engaging with today um mm-hmm. uh so uh i mean there's so many names on my on my list but, but yeah but i think in terms of that idea of um i'm i think when i did that first book for me in a way it was very much a kind of process of going back to basics with um uh, with kind of photography references. So once you've done a degree and an MA and you've, um, you know, you've got your own art practice going, the, 
you sort of there's a natural sort of um, rites of passage of, of photographers that you go through. Like, uh, uh, for example, on Henri Cartier Bresson um, is a photographer that most people who are have a vague interest in photography are, are introduced to quite early on because mm-hmm. his work is. Um, very beautiful it's about capturing the moment um it's sort of nostalgic now and mm-hmm. and the man had just incredible eyes you know and he was recording the world in a, in a, in a very specific beautiful way that really sort of in a, for, for many people just sums up what photography is or what it should be used for capturing moments and but after a while with with, with photographers like Cartier Bresson you sort of move past them and you put them in your past and you sort of, they become a bit of a sort of, you know, you wouldn't really reference him as like an an inspiration or an influence if you were, you know, as you, as you mature as an artist, it's, but actually having, when I wrote that first book, Mm -hmm. I revisited those people because they were sort of relevant to readers who were being introduced to photography and, in terms of techniques, their work does illustrate certain techniques very, very beautifully. And I certainly rediscovered uh, a love and an interest for um, photographers like Cartier-Bresson, and, um, who, who I'd sort of forgotten about or disregarded. And uh, yeah. they, they definitely became – it was a nice process for me in terms of putting those books together because it was a – an opportunity to revisit work that I had sort of forgotten about or hadn't seen for a while and often very historical work. Um, so I, uh, uh, you know, I surround myself with a lot of contemporary images, but also it's nice to really keep immersed in those historical, historical, uh, masters as well. Um, okay. Uh, and I, and I, and I think in terms of, I think you're as 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 someone who either takes pictures or appreciates images. Your tastes also change as as you as you um, grow older, or your interests. You know, you, you develop specific interests in one area or the other. For example, when I was studying, at, uh, you know, um, on my degree courses, the idea of street photography was a little bit kind of like it wasn't being really taken seriously. It was something. That was done in the past, and uh, you know, you wouldn't really be able to justify a fine art college saying, "Oh, yeah, I'm just going to go and take street photographs like um, Cartier Bresson or whatever." Um, but now, uh, that sort of area of photography and that idea of capturing the moment has become so much more relevant to contemporary practice. So there's a sort of rediscovery of of those. Um, you know, historical figures as well, and they're informing what contemporary photographers are doing. So there's always this kind of cycle of people that go in and out of fashion with photography. Um, mm-hmm. And I think naturally is you, you just sort of do that yourself. You, you, you kind of get bored of certain work and then a few years later you rediscover it or you kind of fall in love with some, you know, someone's work. And then after a while you're just like, oh, actually – like this is this work is terrible, you know. It's sort of mm-hmm. sort of fooled me in a way. It seduced me, and, and, and now I'm sort of over it. Um, so, so it's it's a bit I'm of like constant, a... yeah. I... It's I'm constantly discovering new work and revisiting work, and it's feeding into all sorts of areas. Okay, yeah. So it sounds like it's like a bit of like a revolving door, but you still might go back to some of those those um artists that you yeah. were looking at before. Yeah. So that was a long answer to your quick question. Hey, listen, no worries at all. Take as long as you need. <laughs> all right. So, um, and this is not a quick question, but a part of that a little bit. Um, I'm assuming you still go out and take photographs from time to time. Um, you said before you were interested in landscapes, I believe it was. Yeah. Is that more so what you do now? Like, has that always been your thing or is it still like a little bit of everything? Uh, I mean, like, to be honest with you, I, I don't really go out and take pictures these days. Um, not so not, much. Not in, not in a serious way. Uh, I, um, I'm not going to say that I, 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 it's not like something that I 
have sort of closed the door on. But at the moment, I'm so involved with my writing and other areas that my I, I actually don't really go and take pictures um, at all um, for the moment. But I'm still, okay. like, like you said, uh, my my interest was in, in sort of issues and ideas around landscape. And that is a kind of subject area really fascinates me still. And I sort of engage with it through other people's work um, rather than my own. Okay. So the following quick question that I have for you, um, you may be able to answer this. So I'm just going to ask it anyway. Um, what is the most ridiculous photo you've taken or the most unorthodox like sequence of getting a photo? Um, if you have one. Um, I don't, I don't know if it's a ridiculous uh, photo. When, when I was um, on my – the last body of work I did was um, these, these, um, these tabletop models that I created in a studio, and um, they would take – I, I worked with a model maker friend of mine, and mm-hmm. they, would t- they would take us um, sometimes months to, to create – and oh, so. they were they they were really designed they were made to then be photographed and then we would destroy them um, part of the process was destroying the landscape in a way that we created and the only thing you were left with was the image of it because it only really worked as an image um and i think in a way it it, it is sort of <laughs> i think it's strangely ridiculous to spend months on yeah. a single picture, perhaps. Um, and uh, even though I think I was very pleased with the out- outcome, I think that they they uh, they were successful in, in, in many ways. Uh, I think it sort of in a strange way highlighted for me the absurdity of, of grown-ups okay. making pictures. <laughs> yeah, know? it's definitely interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, I think that's the thing. We have to always remember that, you know, if we're artists or image makers, there, there's a sort of one has to maintain the playfulness of it or self-awareness of the kind of indulgent aspects of it um, and keep it buoyant in that way. I think a lot of people can get um, sort of weighed down by their practice. And yeah. uh, we... But- yeah, we need to keep spice it up a bit, keep it interesting. Keep it, just keep interested. I think. Keep you know? interested. I think. I think keep interested in what we are doing. I think. I think a lot of artists get to a point where they just go through the motions, and actually, they get a bit bored of, of their work or their, their routine and process. And I think it's really important to always maintain an enthusiasm and interest. Because if you don't, that then it's is showing the work itself. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm imagining that leads to burnout or, you know, just falling out of love with what you're doing. And yeah. I don't think anybody wants that at all. No, and, and there are some there are some artists, writers, musicians that just do not take a break, that they just continue producing, continue creating, and it works for them. But for a lot of people, I think it's very healthy to sometimes just take a break from what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, accept that you're not going to create for a while, and then come back to it feeling fresh and energized. Um, yeah, often, so, often we need to kind of take have a distance from our work um, to really see and understand what we're doing. Yeah, like a, a reflection period, I think, is needed. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's it's kind of interesting how some people are able to just to keep you know pushing out more and more uh, projects or whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, I mean, I'm somewhere so like I'm sure somewhere along the line they are able to to reflect on it, but mm. you know, taking that brief uh, little time gap, I think allows you to breathe a little bit more and kind of take in mm. everything that you've done or the things that you want to do in the future from then. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, and this is just one more quick question. Uh, it has nothing to do with anything else. Um, what's one place that you want to travel that you have not been to before? And why? Um, I uh, where would I go that I haven't been to? Um, I 
Yeah, take your time because I, I usually ask <laughs> most of the, <laughs> the guests. Sure. Actually, well, I I want to go to Mexico. So I'm going to Mexico City in a, in a couple of months, and uh, oh, nice. excited to go there. I haven't been to to Mexico City before. I uh, yeah, it's extremely vibrant and exciting. Um, I yeah. uh, I'm, I'm I I've been to Japan to Tokyo before, but I'd love to explore uh, more of the country there and. Um, I, I mean, I've only been in America for, for just over two years. So I also, um, I've, I've been lucky enough to see a lot of America, but there's so much I still want to, to explore. And uh, so yeah. while, while I'm here, I'm really kind of, um, uh, you know, keen to make the most of seeing, seeing um, as much of America as possible. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been here for, or I grew up here, I was born here, but uh, <laughs> I've only ever really been on the East Coast, I want to say. So, yeah, uh, like New York to Florida, I've hit every state underneath mm-hmm. of that. And then I've, yeah, but I mean, I've never really been out on the West Coast or, you know, middle of the country or anything like that. And to be fair, there's yeah. not a whole lot going on there, but. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, is there or isn't there? Photography in America has such a kind of, um, you know, they're so intertwined in, in, in the kind of road trip culture and, and oh, that's fair. in the 18th century when um, people living in the East, uh, you know, were opening up the West and discovering all of these landscapes, laying down the railroads. You know, photographers were accompanying those geological surveys and discovering and recording those incredible landscapes in the West as, as they were being discovered. Um, so, so America actually, in terms of for people interested in photography and photography history and photo culture in general, is a really rich place to, to explore. And you, you, you talk about, um, I know exactly what you mean when you say there's not much there and kind of like, well, you know, it- but and, and there isn't, but at the same time, photographers like William Eggleston and other mm-hmm. people have really found so much interest in those towns that a lot of us would pass through and not really give much attention or thought to. But actually through through the eyes of someone who is really looking and searching, there's so much to discover in those parts of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at that point that's just down to to maybe their own lived experience or the things that they were able to see that I'm not able to see. Cause from my perspective, yeah, I have, <laughs> I have no interest in going to like, um, I don't know, like Idaho or. Yeah. Um, see, I'd love to go to Idaho. <laughs> I, I mean, of all the, of all the States, I think maybe Indiana and Idaho, everything else in between, I would probably leave out, but yeah. like, same thing. It's nothing there. Like nothing there like really calls my own attention, but that's not to mm. say, you know, somebody else, um, you know, like it's, that's a stomping ground for somebody else. And I think that's, like you said, uh, part of the beauty of like photography. Somebody can see something that I'm not able to. Yeah. And it also gives you a reason to, to, to actually travel. Um, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, sort of uh, Mexico is another place that I actually want to go to, uh, mm-hmm. as well, Mexico and Canada. Cause I have not been to either of those places. And then I had, I had a trip planned to go to Japan um, sometime by the end of the year, like towards the end of the year. So in the process of trying to figure that out, but we'll see. But, uh, yeah, it's looks, a difficult one to, to get to these days. Jap- uh, well, yeah. But, um, yeah, well, you know, it's it's, uh, it's always good to travel. But like, like you said, you know, you, you always see places – uh, if, if you're not from a place or, or somewhere, you can always see it through different eyes um, and appreciate it for different reasons. Like, like going back to that Robert Frank example I mentioned oh, yeah. earlier, the Americans, you know, the fact that he was from Europe and he was an immigrant who came to America, he was seeing it in a completely different way to, to, to your, the average American because he, he, was, he wasn't from there. So... In terms of photography and travel and being an outsider, um, mm-hmm. you know, it, give, it gives you a real advantage sometimes um, to to not be from a place. Um, 
And a lot of photographers uh, take that approach with their work. You know, they purposely throw themselves into the unfamiliar. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And this is not even on the same uh, realm at all, or not like the same. It's not the equivalent of what I'm getting at. But like when I got a chance to go to London, um, and not even from a like a photography standpoint, I went there and I'm like, Oh, this is the most amazing place in the world. It's beautiful. And I'm walking by all these like, like Londoners, if you want to call them that. Um, and everyone's just like casually walking by, but I'm just big. eyed like looking at all these buildings, even though I live right next to a major city, London in particular is like, wow, this place is beautiful, but really yeah, it's just it, another city. In London. Londoners have a point of uh, looking uh, disinterested or, uh, yeah, <laughs> everyone. I was walking down the street. And people were just like casually walking, just glued to their phones, or whatever. I'm like, do you guys not see this building architecture? Like, this is amazing. Do you not see like, yeah, like how like run down these streets are? Like, not even like in a bad way, but just like you could tell the amount of history in that city. And yeah, it's just beautiful. Yeah, to see. and uh, but they, they they're not seeing it, or like, they're so kind of um, it's blind to it because they see it constantly, and that's where they're from. Um, that is their kind of default place. Yeah, and uh, and and uh, it, it makes sense. Someone who is so different can suddenly become excited and see it in completely fresh eyes, and um, you know, that's a really amazing thing to do. Is 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 to is to is to visit these places and experience them with fresh eyes. Because you going back to the idea of like really trying to find your unique voice and um, you know what makes your work different. And, um, yeah, that comes from you, the way that you you see things and the enthusiasm for which you see them, and uh, uh, it's a it's a you know if if you lived in the same place your entire life, sometimes often you become a little bit blind to what's around you. Yeah, and I think that's that's definitely fair to say because even like when I go to Philadelphia now, <laughs> I'm like oh like it's you know I, I appreciate it. It's it's nice to be next to a major city. But like it didn't give me that same feeling that I got when I, you know, went to a different country and went to a different city. Um, mm. But yeah. at the same time, that familiarity, if you sort of like consciously, you know, explore it, the depth of your familiarity with a place can can give you a unique perspective as well. Um, yeah. There's a sort of, you know, there's a choice between you know, the sort of passing through and, uh and experiencing something with excitement and freshness, and that creates a certain kind of image. And then there's a, there's a completely different process of visiting and spending time or revisiting something that you know so well that's so much a part of you. And that that kind of like uh, reality creates a very different kind of image and, and way of working. And there's no shortage of photographers that definitely revisit their, their past, their childhood or youth, precisely that reason it's a kind of um yeah that very respect. emotional space to to operate within yeah no definitely like just being able to spark that up again um hmm. it definitely does something instead of just going through the motions if, especially if you're still in that city or that area uh it's understandable that things would kind of get a little a little stale or maybe you're just like not as appreciative um so hmm. taking a step back and kind of remembering to to be appreciative or to you know I think a little outside of the box. I think yeah. it definitely does hold. So, but yeah. So I think this is a fantastic place to wrap up the episode. Uh, the conversation has been really informative and you've left me with a lot to think about. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but before we, we wrap up and uh, go our separate ways, is there anything that I can um, like help you plug any projects? I know you said you were working on three uh, I am working on yeah three new books. It's a new photography series, but it's it's not it's not due out for uh, another eighteen months, so it's maybe a bit early to to oh. like that. <laughs> but, um, I was looking. I was waiting for you to next month. No, but uh, if um, I mean if anyone is interested to learn more about photography, um, and you know, I my. The read this if you want to take great photograph series i hope would uh introduce you to, to not just techniques but really interesting work and and ways in which photog- photographers are able to really draw um 
on their unique voices to, to create these that are distinctive. And my more recent book, Photographers on Photography, um, that takes a little bit more of a philosophical uh, approach to photography. A lot about what we've been touching on in, in this discussion is, is explored more in that book. Um, so that's less about techniques and much more about the psychology of photography and, uh, and exploring the individual um, ideas and approaches that photographers take um, that we can all sort of like learn from if we so wish. So that, that one is Photographers on Photography, which uh, personally, I, I think, um, is my richest book in terms of ideas and, um, and yeah. work. So I, I, I recommend that one, but I obviously recommend them all. Yeah, uh, I also recommend them all. I actually just got done <laughs> reading um, Photographers on Photography and uh, read this if you want to take great photographs of people. And then um, the base version of that book uh, over the past like month yeah. and a half, I was going through those again. Um, definitely a really good resource. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite books um, for those of you who are listening. Uh, one of my favorite books uh, to kind of reference whenever I just need to, you know, go over some techniques or just get some ideas or just feel a little bit of inspiration. Uh, it's good to go back and kind of check in on this book. So. I also highly recommend uh, when those books that you're writing uh, come out, uh, it might be, you said 18 months from now, but uh, hopefully the podcast is still going strong by that point and I can give people an update on that. Yeah, for sure. That'd be great. But yeah, uh, well, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Me on. No, thank you for sitting down and have this conversation and just for dropping all these really useful nuggets of information. I'm sure all the photographers in uh, the audience will uh, be very grateful for the conversation that we are, we're having right now. So thank you. Yeah, thank you.